All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're now ready to uh, introduce our first panel of the day, Civil Society Democratization and Conflict Resolution. Our moderator is Jonathan Landay of McClatchy News. Uh, each speaker will have about 15 minutes to speak. We are waiting for one last speaker to arrive. As soon as she does, uh, she will take her seat and she will be able to speak. Um, for now, we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end, which our moderator will be moderating. So uh, now I'll just pass it on to Mr. Landy. Good morning. Um, I want to start out by apologizing for my tardiness. Um, being a journalist, I get caught up in the news cycle. And this morning, uh, I, for those of you who uh, don't know, there was a, another, uh, there was a major arrest today of a, the world's most wanted war crime suspect, General Ratko Mladic, in Serbia. Uh, and that kind of kept me um, going this morning for a little while. Um, and then I suddenly realized the alarm went off that I had to get here. And I'm lucky because I only live four blocks away, so that made it a little easy. But, but I think that the Mladic arrest is a good place to start uh, to examine the question of civil society democratization and conflict resolution. Um, because it raises the question to what extent uh, civil society and democratization in uh, a place like Serbia or, 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 or similar countries um, uh, is a result of these processes. Um, and I think, at least in terms of the, the Mladic arrest, it begs the question, to what extent did democratization in Serbia ha lead to this arrest? I think there are a lot of people who would probably agree that it, it had a little bit to do with it, but I think uh, it also raises the question, to what extent did political expediency uh, play a role in this in in this development, um, um, and because one has to ask the, about the extent and the influence that civil society has had, uh, not just in Serbia uh, but in uh, neighboring uh, Bosnia, where uh, there has been a rigorous civil society uh, sector, but yet uh, it is a a, a country. Uh, where there was a peacekeeping operation and, and uh, extensive outside uh, mediation, and yet um, uh, it's a place that may very well be headed back into um, uh, certainly a political conflict and even perhaps violence. Um, one has to ask also, I guess there's going to be a lot of discussion here about Afghanistan. Uh, they have a very, very small uh, civil society, rigorous though, uh, and, and very active, but very small. It has, a, as we all know, 100,000 American troops, 40,000 European troops, uh, trying to um, uh, bring stability to the country. Uh, and obviously, uh, there's a question as to the extent of democratization there. Um, this, we, we are, we are uh, missing one of our speakers this morning, um, uh, uh, Marina Ottaway. Uh, but, uh, this morning we will be hearing on this panel from Joshua Faust. Did I pronounce that right, Josh? Faust, excuse me. Um, who is going to talk about uh, uh, foreign bias in local governance in Central Asia, another place where there, uh, there's a, there was an interesting report yesterday from the international, uh, from, from the um, ICG uh, on uh, the state of affairs in Tajikistan, which is none too. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, reassuring, and I guess you will, you will talk about that to some extent. Um, and also, uh, 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 Angel, is it? It's Angel Mike. My wife calls me Angel, so it's okay. Okay. Uh, Rabasa, he's a senior political scientist from the RAND Corporation. Um, and I guess you're going to deal with the role of political Islam? Of, uh, no, actually, I'll be talking about civil society in general okay. and the role of civil society in political transitions. Okay. from authoritarianism to democracy. Okay, and I just forgot to mention that Joshua here mm -hmm. is a fellow at the American Security Project. Um, and I used to read your blog, but is it still going on? Is, is yeah. that just <laughs> it, it, is a fan, it was a fantastic blog. And anyone interested who's, who's interested in Afghanistan and, uh, and environs should read, should read the blog. Um, yeah, I'll start my more general uh, the subject uh, of my presentation. Um, and first of all, I, I would like to thank, oh, 
Oh, sorry. How do you? Oh, yes, I know. I said it. Yeah, of... It's not plugged. Yeah, it's on. It's on? Oh, okay. <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, you know, first of all, I would, I would like to thank uh, the Berkeley Center and, uh, and the Rumi Forum and my good friends Emily and Sidki and Jenna for uh, inviting me to participate in this, uh, in this event. Uh, um, I would like to start by saying that this short presentation uh, is based on some work in progress at my institution that in fact we just began uh, a couple of months ago on the uh, processes, uh, hi Marina, come in, just began, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes, was saying that my presentation is based on, on work in progress on a project that we just began about a month ago uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the processes of democratization and transitions from authoritarianism to democracy uh, on different continents in what Samuel Huntington called you know, the third, third wave of democratization uh, with a view to derive lessons as to what were the critical factors in these processes and what led to the success or failure of these uh, efforts at demo democratization uh, and what these experiences can tell us to inform policy toward, toward the ongoing democratic revolution uh, in the Arab world today. Uh, uh, before uh, developing this topic further, uh, we need to define what do we mean by civil society. Because everybody talks about civil society, but no one uh, says what it is. Uh, and in fact, there is no, no accepted definition of civil society. The, uh, the World Bank has adopted a definition uh, that refers to the wide array of uh, non-governmental and non-for-profit organizations that have a presence in, uh, in public life uh, expressing the interests and values uh, of their members and others uh, based on ethical, cultural, political, scientific, religious, or philanthropic considerations. Uh, specifically, the term civil society organizations, or CSOs for short, uh, is used to refer to entities uh, such as uh, community groups, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, so NGOs are a subset of civil society, but obviously uh, not the whole thing. Uh, labor unions, uh, indigenous groups, uh, charities, faith-based organizations, professional associations, and foundations. And we uh, use the term in our work uh, to refer to all of the civic, social, cultural, and religious institutions and organizations that form the basis of society and operate outside of the state, but within the framework of the law. <coughs> a civil society is intrinsic to a well-functioning democratic state. Uh, in democratic states, the operations of uh, civil society organizations are complementary to those of the state and are underpinned by liberal democratic assumptions and institutions. Uh, some argue that the development of uh, civil society requires uh, freedom of speech, of association, of religion, and independent judiciary and democratic political institutions. Conversely, uh, there is an inherent tension between civil society and the authoritarian state especially where civil society organizations become important actors for the delivery of social services and channels for the expression of popular demands. Uh, here, it is important to make a distinction among degrees of authoritarianism uh, in relation to civil society. At the totalitarian end of the scale, uh, for instance, the uh, former communist states, uh, Burma, Syria, Libya, uh, Iraq under the Ba'ath Party. The state controls all organized expressions of society. And this is fundamentally different from authoritarian states, especially those where democratic transitions have occurred, uh, 
including, for example, the Philippines under Marcos, uh, Indonesia under Suharto, Spain under Franco, Portugal under Salazar, uh, Greece under the colonels, and Brazil, Argentine, Argentine, and Chile under military regimes, uh, and I would argue Egypt under Mubarak, and Ben Al and Tunisia under Ben Ali, uh, and many other cases to numerous to to mention here, where the authoritarian regime allowed civil society organizations to operate within certain limitations. For instance, uh, religious and social service organizations were, were able to function as long as they did not involve themselves, themselves in politics or pose a perceived threat to the stability of a regime. Um, for instance, um, in Indonesia, um, Muhammadiyya and Nadlatul Ulama, the two largest Muslim civil service organizations in the world, with a membership of between 20 and 30 million members each, operated very much without official interference uh, under the Suharto regime. They ran schools, thousands of schools, universities, the whole university system on the part of uh, Muhammadija, hospital, um, provided uh, social services, and were able to exercise significant influence on political and social issues. The Catholic Church in the Philippines and its uh, leader, Cardinal Sin, uh, under Marcos, not only retained its independence, but constituted one of the most powerful political forces in the Philippines and played a critical role in the replacement of the Marcos regime, as many of you know. Um, another case in point is the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Although I consider the Hikwan as a political rather than a religious or social entity. Um, although it was officially banned throughout most of the Mubarak regime, the Brotherhood was allowed to function, uh, to run a complex network of hospitals and social services, and Brotherhood members were allowed to run for parliament and sometimes be elected as independents, of course, not members of the organization. In many, and I would say most cases, uh, authoritarian regimes allowed the independent media, especially the newspapers, because the regimes were usually more concerned about the, uh, uh, the electronic media that, that, that leased the masses than the papers that were generally led by a small uh, elite of the, of the population. And nevertheless, they were allowed to operate, uh, and they used censorship as a vehicle to control the message. And this is a fundamental point because censorship does not imply actual control of the media. And in some cases, uh, opposition newspapers, uh, such as uh, Cathy Merini under the Greek colonels, or La Prensa in Nicaragua, where I served in the, in the 1970s, in the late Somoza period, uh, in the Foreign Service, uh, they actually became the focal points of opposition to the regime. Um, now, you compare that to the situation in Syria uh, today or Iraq under Saddam where no sign of, uh, of opposition was permitted. Uh, another important component is um, of, uh, of NGOs in the role in building up civil society and promoting democracy has been, excuse me, uh, the NGOs, which I mentioned earlier. And especially uh, the NGOs that take a role in democracy promotion. Uh, some of them are beneficiaries of international funding. And this international connection has provided NGOs not only with the means to carry out their functions, but also with a degree of protection from the regime, particularly where that regime receives international assistance and therefore needs to manifest some respect for the values of the donor countries or institutions. Uh, nevertheless, these, uh, these NGOs operating in an authoritarian environment uh, need to maintain to struggle, need to struggle to maintain their independence since they are often uh, viewed with suspicion 
or hostility by the regime. Uh, in most cases, the NGOs have to register with the authori authorities. Uh, they have to meet the requirements that the regime might set for registration, clear security investigations, and promise to refrain from activities that the government might object to. The authorities can and do audit operating budgets, uh, infiltrate agents into the uh, major associations, uh, impose arbitrary fines, and could dissolve the group if found to be in violation of some regulation. The governments can pressure international donors uh, to cease funding a group that it objects to, as in the case of Mubarak and the United States. Or, as in the case of uh, Venezuela under Chavez, it could prohibit NGOs from ac accepting international assistance. Nevertheless, even though they operate under, could op operate under quite severe restrictions, once the transition begins, the NGOs can play and have played a key role in the consolidation of democracy. The point is that pre-existing civil society institutions and organizations, even if operating under severe restrictions, constitute, judging by the history of successful democratic transitions, a key and maybe an indispensable factor in the consolidation of democratic governance. A body of scholarly literature illustrates uh, this point uh, and argues that in democratic transitions around the world, uh, civil society can facilitate the process by restraining state coercion, increasing the costs of repression, and generating international support for the transition. And according to a study by Freedom House, civic resistance played a vital role in driving 50 out of 67 modern transitions from authoritarian rule to democracy. Having said that, uh, let me add that there are ob some objections to this thesis. There's always objections to any, any thesis. And one relates to the definition of civil society organizations. For instance, whether Islamists can be considered part of democratic civil society. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Muslim Brotherhood. The question is whether an Islamist organization such as the Brotherhood supports democratic objectives or whether they seek to use democratic means to impose a different form of authorit authoritarianism or at least to capture a share of public space for purposes that are not consistent with liberal democracy, <coughs> or to get away from the problem of Islamism and democracy in cases where the obstacles to democracy derive from the political culture itself, whether NGO activities are infected by undemocratic practices. Uh, for instance, uh, a scholar of Southeast Asia noted that the behavior of some NGOs in the Philippines has sometimes been shaped by the pervasive patron-client patron system that operates in that country, and that this is a system that the NGOs are ostensibly dedicated to change. <clears throat> so to um, conclude my presentation, since I'm running out of my 15 minutes, uh, let me say that, yes, uh, it's very important, especially as the, the Arab world moves into this stage of transition, for uh, international actors, as, as the United States especially, to engage civil society. That is not enough to deal on a government-to-government -government basis. We must try to engage these uh, non non-state actors that are shaping, that are driving political change. At the same time, we have to be careful whom to engage. And I think that, as we have noted in some of our other works, uh, there has to be some criteria for, uh, for the partners that, uh, that we could have. Uh, for instance, do, do, this, do these actors accept the fundamental <coughs> liberal democratic values that we share? Uh, do they respect the rights of women, uh, religious, and ethnic minorities? 
do they renounce the use of violence and terrorism to attain their goals? And I think this is the direction that we should go. Thank you. <clears throat> So I, I think that was actually a, a great introduction of, of getting us up to speed on, on kind of the, the broad topic of civil society. And it's interesting because when you, when you look at Central Asia, and I'm, I'm going to use this kind of a, a pivot point to, to go into my real comments, you actually see kind of a reversion of civil society groups in that region. Uh, very recently, Human Rights Watch was just kicked out of Uzbekistan. Turkmenistan has adopted the tactic of imprisoning journalists and sending them to psychiatric hospitals for opposing the regime. Uh, Tajikistan just spent $33 million building the world's biggest flagpole, which is actually more money than USAID spends in development efforts in the country in a single year. So there's this complete lack of priority towards uh, these regimes. And Partly we could say that's because of transition activities. But since the 90s, there's been a, a rather remarkable regression in civil society activities, especially with civil society NGOs in the region. And uh, that's been accelerating recently. I think uh, last month's election in Kazakhstan is probably a great example of this, where the opposition didn't even bother to show up, despite being very lavishly funded by uh, outside NGOs, because they had no chance in winning, and the regime played so many games with the election, they just figured, what's the point? Most of them voted for uh, President Nazarbayev anyways. But when we look at, at, at this idea of transition and the role that civil society groups can play in transition and in the fostering of some kind of democratic social system, I think Afghanistan makes for an interesting case of when that doesn't really happen or when it doesn't work out. If you want to put it in these terms, Afghanistan's transition happened in about 2002 or so. And it happened when there was no civil society in the country. And it didn't happen because of any civil society groups. It happened because of the US military. And since then, despite all of this outpouring in aid and relief by both NGOs and by the State Department and by international organizations, the U.S. military still is the primary civil society actor and the primary promoter of civil society activities inside Afghanistan, at least in terms of dollars and geographic reach. Taking it a step further, the U.S. military has actually adopted the use of secondary militaries within Afghanistan as its primary means of promoting civil society. And this causes a whole host of problems that we'll be talking about today. One of the most interesting that I find from the perspective of what actually will be affecting the next generation of leadership that comes up, I think, and, and this is just my personal opinion, for, for all intents and purposes, the current generation of leadership in Afghanistan is a lost cause. They're never going to change. They're probably going to be corrupt until they die. Uh, but the next, the next round of people, the next generation, people in their teens and in their 20s who are currently experiencing this country, they're going to be the ones who eventually affect the direction that it goes in. And it's interesting to see the split that, that arises because of this. Uh, because of the security situation, uh, Pashtuns in the South have very little access to education to outside groups, to foreigners, whereas ethnic minorities like Tajiks, Hazars, and Uzbeks do have a lot of access to education, to foreign networks, to these international organizations that operate in the country. What this ends up creating over time is you have an uneducated, disconnected ethnic majority and an educated, connected minority. This is being exacerbated by U.S. efforts to train the Afghan National Army because it is primarily Tajik and Uzbek and Hazara in ethnic makeup and because the army is the best and most reliable means that people, that Afghans who join up have of becoming literate. Uh, in a way, the ANA is the largest school operating inside Afghanistan because of the number of people they train up to. I think it's a third grade reading level is what they want adults to have. So when we look at, 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 at this broad concept of civil society and how we can begin applying it to somewhere like Afghanistan, where there is a war going on and there is an, at least a desire by everyone, a stated desire, to transition from war to peace at some point in the future, I think it's important to look then at how we're actually laying the foundation for that transition to happen. In this case, looking at the way that we're building up civil society, you can see it almost as an abuse of the idea of civil society. In a way, the US is creating a military without a state or a military without a society inside Afghanistan. Part of this is because I'm Westerners in general, and I think do-gooders in, 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 in a very, very specific way, tend to assume that their own concepts of what, uh, uh, their own experiences of what civil society or what some kind of doing good group means are the best ones. 
That's why you have the military doing what it does best, which is creating another military. In the process of creating that, they were realizing all of these other secondary effects of having a military without a society. And so now they're scrambling to try to create a, a society to, to support the same military. So when, when the military, for lack of a better way of framing this then, the best way of affecting civil society development in Afghanistan is to affect the military and the way that the military is trying to develop this civil society. And this is where you run into a whole host of problems. Uh, and I'm coming at this, I spent uh, several years actually working as an advisor for the US Army dealing with social and cultural issues inside Afghanistan. And they have, a, they have a lot of problems going on. One of the biggest ones are assumptions about how Afghanistan itself works. And I think this is a feature you find in a lot of foreigner-based and to a lesser extent foreigner-funded NGOs, especially in Central Asia, which are assumptions, in a way, Orientalist assumptions about how these societies work. The biggest one, I think, in Afghanistan is this belief that the whole country is tribal in some way. And you hear people talk about tribes all the time. Uh, at least in the military, they want to engage the tribes, whatever that means. Uh, and when you look at how they try to develop local groups in particular, and you've seen this a lot in the south of the country, when they try to develop some kind of community organization groups, they tend to be based around this concept of tribe. And I'm putting scare quotes around that for a very good reason. Um, there's kind of universal academic consensus that, that tribe inside Afghanistan is a completely meaningless concept. Uh, it means a different thing to every single person you talk to. Uh, it can literally mean anything the person you're talking to cares about at that one point in time. Uh, it can mean a community, a village, a family, a school, um, some kind of other organization they've joined, a tanzim if they're involved in a militia in some way. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite literally undefinable. Yet that is how, the, uh, how ISAF, how NATO, how the US military are defining their terms of engagement inside Afghanistan. I think this causes a rather obvious host of problems afterward, where if you don't understand the group that you're choosing to organize your efforts by, then you don't understand the efforts that you're doing. And you certainly aren't going to understand the effects that they have down the line. So I'm going to use uh, two different examples here that I think can kind of drive this home. And, and, and they're, they're personal examples from, from ones that I, that I experienced. One is with this district in, in Host province in the east part of the country called Sabari. Uh, in this area, there, it's normally described as a, as a tribal place, as, as an area of great tribal conflict. And this is because there are autonomous communities of people, usually organized by village, who call themselves tribe, who bicker and fight all the time. Uh, one of the biggest one is between these two groups, uh, called the Mongol and the Sabari, uh, in the northern part of the district, and it's essentially over a stand of trees. For the first two years that, that the U.S. Army was operating in this area, they couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on. They kept trying to send tribal mediators, which we found out later were really just guys they found on the street who said they were tribal mediators to go resolve this conflict. Uh, but over, over the course of several years, after actually losing a lot of people from the fighting, both from the Army and, and among the Afghan population, they found out it was literally two different clusters of houses fighting over a bunch of trees on a hillside. And this conflict had nothing to do with anyone's tribe. The tribe actually came after the conflict itself arose. And it happened to be an easy way for these communities to organize their conflict. It happened to be an easy way for them to describe their conflict to outsiders. It's much easier to say, well, we have this ancient tribal feud with these other people than we're bickering over who gets to eat dates this month. Um, and it, 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 it snowballed from there, that there was this assumption that tribe was driving things. And for a very, very long time, tribe was dictating how the military was trying to respond to this conflict point. Uh, I think it, it, I guess we can, can segue about this briefly. Within Afghanistan, these, these small scale local tribal conflicts uh, are probably the biggest driver of instability throughout the country. It's not actually the Taliban. It's small groups of people usually fighting over local issues. What happens when outsiders come in and pick sides in these disputes, in this case in host, in an attempt at conflict resolution, they create winners and losers. The Taliban moves in, talks to the losers, and offers to fund and support their fight. Then we get insurgency. That's usually the pattern that, that, that follows, at least in, in eastern Afghanistan. So what had been happening over the last several years in this Sabari district in Khos province is the U.S., in its attempt to mediate a tribal dispute, was unwittingly creating the conditions for a permanent insurgency in the district. 
Uh, and, and this gets back to the idea of fundamentally misunderstanding a society that you're working in, making wrong assumptions about how that society works, and then going ahead and, and crafting policies based on that wrong assumption. Uh, another one is this province called Kapisa province, which is just north of Kabul. And this is a, a much more ethnically diverse area than, than host provinces. The southern half of it is Pashtun, the northern half is Tajik, and the eastern part has this, this uh, uh, kind of unknown group called the Pashai. So in this area, again, there's an assumption that the primary conflict, like most of Afghanistan, is going to be ethnic, or in some cases, tribal. And when we were there, the biggest question the military kept asking us, in this case the French, was who are the tribes, what are the tribes, we need to map out these tribes and figure out who we need to influence within these tribes. And that turned out to be completely wrong. What we found out instead is that in Kapisa, everything is political. So the province had been fought over for several decades, in fact, by rival political parties. They're called Tanzims in Afghanistan because their political parties also have armies. Uh, and one of those armies was the Northern Alliance. The other one was Hezbi Islami Gulbuddin, which is a, an, an insurgent group. And what had been happening since 2001 is that the losers, uh, Hezbi Islami Gulbuddin in the south, this group called Harakati Islami, were losing out. Even though their people had decided to join the government, they decided to lay down their arms, they were being frozen out of the political power structure in the province. They weren't given positions of prominence, they weren't allowed to take over governorship or sub-governorships, and everyone from Jamiati Islami, which was the main group in the Northern Alliance, was being put in charge. This polit the leftover from this political imbalance was fueling a lot of conflict. The losers, again, were reaching out to the insurgency for support to fight this war. The military was looking at it and assuming that it was just tribes. So when, when, when we examine how the military then tries to look at this stuff, and in particular how the United States tries to frame these conflicts, what we usually see is a mistake for local politics or for kind of the, the starters of a civil society being mistaken as some other kind of security issue. And because of that, they end up militarizing what would otherwise be simply a political issue. Um, and I think I'm kind of out of time, so it's not really a conclusion, but that's kind of <laughs> where I was going with this. Good morning, and let me start by apologizing for arriving in late. I am uh, a, I'm a good lesson in the importance of reading the fine print. I read Georgetown, and I stopped there. I went to the campus, and then I discovered that I was in the wrong place. So excuse my, uh, uh, my being late. I will continue uh, uh, the, sort of in this uh, uh, pattern of skepticism about a civil society that my predecessor has established. And I will start by uh, uh, giving you an, an anecdote that to me was very telling uh, about how we really need to, th to rethink what we mean by civil society and how we engage with civil society. There is no doubt that citizens are at the root of democracy. There is no doubt that citizens' participation is what democracy is all about, which is a very different thing from saying Civil society is what is, uh, democracy is all about, at least uh, not civil society in the way it is usually defined, particularly in the West at this particular time. Uh, we had a good luck uh, with uh, two other, uh, the, we being the Carnegie Endowment and two other organizations of having decided last November to hold a conference in April on the role of external actors in promoting change in the Arab world. This was in November. The conference was scheduled for, uh, uh, for April. We held it in very, very different circumstances from what we had envisaged when we started. And the participants were, other than the usual Western suspects, including all the organizations that, that support democratic transformation against civil society uh, in the world, and particularly in the Middle East, we had a number of activists from Arab countries that were uh, both those undergoing transitions and not undergoing transition. And in the course of the discussion, one participant, a very well-known scholar from uh, Jordan, but it could have been anybody else in the room, said uh, civil society has not played any role whatsoever in the uprisings. And everybody around the room agreed with him. And I was the only one to, you know, I was taken aback 
at the beginning, because uh, you mean civil society has played no role. Here you have tens of thousands of citizens in the, uh, out in the streets. If this is not a civil society, what is civil society? What they meant is the NGOs that the Western countries have painstaking promoting in these countries, building up that they have been financing, that they have been training, were not in, they were not anywhere to be seen. And in that sense, civil society did not play, play any role. Citizens did, but not to the organizations that we created. Now, the question that that leads me to is, it's a real question about what are these organizations of civil society on which we have put so much emphasis ever since the fall of the socialist regime in Eastern Europe that have become such a uh, such an important component of the so, the, the so-called toolkit for democracy promotion that Western organizations use, and so on. Uh, I'm going to the, I'm relying in trying to answer this question on a previous studies that I carried out with a colleague of mine, Tom Carruthers, also at the Carnegie Endowment. And that was a study of civil society organization in four regions of the world, essentially. We looked at, we, uh, we, t we uh, traded depth for breadth, essentially, uh, excuse me, breadth for depth. We looked pretty much across Latin America, Africa. Uh, we did not do the Middle East at that point because this was a study carried out in uh, uh, in the late 90s, and there was nothing going on in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East at that time. And we looked at some Asian countries. And what we found is that while there had been, in all these countries, hundreds of NGOs that had been set up in the previous years, very few were surviving. And not only very few were surviving, but very f there, had, uh, there was also a tremendous amount, I would say, of cynicism in this case concerning these, these NGOs. I was uh, doing some work in, uh, uh, I, I traveled a lot as part of this. I talked to a lot of people. And I'll give you two examples again that, are, uh, that to me were quite telling. One, I was talking to the uh, uh, to uh, the leader of one of the civil society or one of the NGOs in Croatia, and he who was probably a good person. The organization was doing it was a human rights group was doing the right things and so on. But he said essentially all these what are these organizations are really doing is to provide jobs for out of work intellectuals. Essentially, this is really, and there was this deep sense of cynicism about it. I heard the same thing after the, after the fall of Milosevic in Serbia. People, civil society uh, uh, representatives in that country say, okay, now it's our turn. We are going to have, you know, two years in the limelight. There is going to be money coming in, and then we know very well from previous experience that the money is going to move to the next crisis, to the next countries, and most of the organization we are setting up are going to disappear. Third example, and then I'll, try, uh, I'll draw the conclusion, so that this was in Azerbaijan. And I was talking, again, I was looking at civil society organization, and in the course of the con conversation, more and more people told me, you really have to talk to so-and-so because he is one of the main drivers in the civil society world and so on. So I called him up and he says, oh, you called at the right time. Do you want to come to me tomorrow out in whatever province it was? I'm going to do a training session for civil society activists. Of course, I said, yes, this is my time. And, uh, you know, this is my occasion to really look at civil society at work. So I went and we drove for bumpy roads for, eight, uh, for four hours and then four hours back on bumpy roads. And what was the training sessions? And I had, uh, I had expected in my, in my naivete, I would say, in this case, something about community organizing. It was all about how to write a grant proposal for Western organization. You know, this is what you are looking for. You have to also look carefully about what this organization, you know, to whom they have given grant, grants because there is a way of writing the grant proposal that it was going to lead. So, 
what, what is the morale here of all these stories, essentially? That a lot of these organizations that we are creating in the name of civil society are organizations that are not embedded in their society. They, they are detached. They, they do talk to the West and to the funders a lot more than they talk to their own, uh, a lot more than they talk to their own people. And one of the problems that we are facing, I think, is the West, if you want, as outsiders that want to do something to help democratic transitions in these countries, is to figure out how we redirect ourselves, how we rethink who are the interlocutors on the other side. Let me point out that, that there is a very pernicious effect of this uh, creating organizations that are totally dependent on the West. First, that they don't last because usually they disappear. With the last check, they, dis they disappear, right? And if we are honest to ourselves, we are not going to f fund these organizations forever. As my, the, my Serbian, uh, the, the Serbian uh, the civil society people I was quoting knew very well, we are going to move on to the next crisis. You know, the, it's not a, who is, who is uh, really deeply involved in uh, promoting civil society organization in the Balkans nowadays? You know, the, 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 there is a new frontier. There are new crises that we have to uh, uh, that we have to respond to. Second, the other issue that I think it's very uh, uh, that it's very important is that it's now a mandate of all aid organizations, all Western aid organizations, and this is true from the IMF and the World Bank to the most liberal of the uh, of the Scandinavian uh, of the Scandinavian groups that you do not launch a program without consulting with civil society because we have to partner with civil society well you know, wh whom do we consult? We consult the organizations that we have set up. And so that very often we talk to ourselves. We, in the name of consulting with civil society, in the end, we, we talk to ourselves. The idea that it's crucial that we talk to civil society is, up, you know, is absolutely correct. I fully embrace it. But how do we move from the civil society, which is dependent, which is our creation in some way, to the civil society that it's, uh, that it's, uh, 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 that it's useful. And that is a, that's genuine in a sense. And that is very, very difficult proposition because the civil society that is, that's created spontaneously, that is genuine, is not necessarily something that we like very much. The idea, uh, it's not always democratic. We don't know how democratic it is. Who is that genuine civil society in the Arab world right now? It's not uh, the NGOs, it's the protesters. What do we know about the protesters? Essentially, very, very little. You know, the, yes, we meet uh, some of them. We, uh, uh, Carnegie had been holding meetings. We, we, I cannot say that we saw the upheavals that happened coming, but we had noticed, and I hope the CIA had uh, also, that there was a lot of protest going on around the Arab world. There were a lot of strikes, there were a lot of youth groups, and we were trying to figure out what was the significance. We met with a lot of, uh, with a lot of, of people, with the, because that's one of the things we do. We hold meetings, we talk to people, and so on. We don't know very much about them. Uh, you know, some of them seem very appealing people, uh, they are very, uh, they are very interesting people. Some of them are very determined not to take any money from the West. Some of them are very determined not to form NGOs. One thing that we got very early on in dialogues with Egyptians was, we are not going to form any organizations. Why did they, f th did they use Facebook and Twitter? They did not want to form organizations, and this was very deliberate, because they knew that they formed the organizations with a structure. The government would find out who they were and put them all in jail, essentially, so that the only solution for them was this networking. There are two cultures here. There are two concepts of civil society that really do not mesh very well at this point. How can the West move? How can the uh, uh, you know organizations that uh, that are trying to help this transition? How can they move from between these different types of organization? How can we move from creating organizations in some ways in our own image? 
you know, you, it's not only the military that creates that that creates other militaries. We create uh, we create NGOs that are structured along the lines of the NGOs that that function in Western countries in the 21st century, whether or not uh, they have anything to do with a place like Afghanistan or they have to do uh, to do with anything else. We have not given su sufficient thought. We have not even started, I think, trying to figure out how we really relate to this new civil society. And I would argue that if we really want to support these, uh, that if we really want to support this transition, if we want to play a useful role in supporting those transitions, we really we have to rethink which civil society groups. Uh, you know, how we engage with this very different, uh, uh, lend, you know, um, number of groups, uh, assembly of strange groups that are out, out there, but who are the ones that are driving, that are driving the change. Just at the last comment, I do not have the impression that we are really thinking about it, and then there is much work being done on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you want to ask a question, but as the moderator, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative just to throw a couple of ideas out. I, I, I'm hearing uh, a couple of themes from each one of our um, panelists. Um, we're hearing about the need to, to, to rethink the way the West deals with NGOs um, we, uh, and civil society. We're hearing about the need for criteria, to set criteria up in terms of that kind of a choice. Um, and we're hearing about how we're applying Western concepts to uh, the idea, to, to, the, to, to what we think these organizations are and how we need to support them. Let me throw a couple of things out. Just on the other side of the ledger, I would throw out that there are some models, uh, and I want to ask you about this, particularly you raised Serbia, B92, uh, the independent broadcaster in Belgrade started out as a dependent of uh, the United States uh, uh, Agency for International Development uh, and has transformed itself into a commercial enterprise and is very much a viable commercial enterprise today. I would say the same for Koha de Torre, uh, the newspaper in Kosovo. The Afghan Human Rights uh, Organization, Independent Human Rights Organization, is a pretty uh, powerful voice, although small but very powerful, uh, and it seems to be have a, a, a considerable amount of influence in, in Afghanistan. Uh, similarly for the Afghan media, and looking at Bahrain, there's the Bahrain, uh, the Bahraini uh, Human Rights Organization uh, is managing to keep uh, that situation very much uh, in, in, the, in focus. So th there are some successful models out there. On the other side of the ledger, perhaps you would, one of you could also comment on uh, what the other concepts of uh, human, uh, of, of civil society, uh, NGOs are. For instance, in Pakistan, you have lashkar e taiba which is responsible for uh, the Mumbai atrocity, and yet uh, it is first on the scene with its social services uh, in both the Pakistani uh, 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 earthquake and the flooding that we just saw, substituting itself, f its, its services for the lack of state services. And similarly, in Lebanon, Hezbollah has done the very same thing, and not only is it substituting itself for uh, state services, but it is a part of the government and it is a beneficiary of uh, the, so the, 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 at least as far as they've gotten, uh, the democratization uh, of, of Lebanon as well. So I'm wondering if, if one of you might or two of you might want to comment on, on all of those ideas. Sorry. Well, I can uh, say a few words on that, perhaps to begin with. There are certainly some uh, some successful examples, and there are also some dependent organizations that are doing good work. I think uh, there are a lot of human rights groups in various countries that do perform a very useful role in monitoring what the, uh, uh, the you know what is happening in the country, what the situation is for uh, for uh, uh, human rights in the countries, and are worth uh, and are worth uh, uh, supporting. The examples of uh, you know these dramatic examples of organizations that start completely dependent and then go on to become commercial enterprises, they exist, but they are few. I think by and large the uh, the more typical situation is the organization that disappears after a few years, the essentially never to, uh, uh, never to be seen again. This issue of the civil society organizations that are well-rooted in the society, uh, and 
there are innumerable of these groups. Certainly, all the Islamist organizations around the, the Arab world have a very strong social service component. It's part of the Islamic tradition. It's, you know, you can say it's partly tradition and partly tactic. I mean, you can, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and I don't think that it's very easy to separate the two. Those are the very complicated, th those are the very complicated ones. But for one thing, it's, l let me give an example. And that to me is a really challenging because the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is not, an, uh, is not a terrorist organization. They are not going around planting bombs and so on. We will not, no Western uh, uh, NGO support program touches the work that the Muslim, uh, that the, the social uh, assistance side of the Muslim Brotherhood does. And they're the ones who are doing probably the most important work. They run clinics all over the slums of Cairo. And since they are smart politically, they serve the cops as well as they serve the Muslims. They are not uh, stupid enough to discriminate. They are the ones who provide tutoring for the children, who provide the, after, uh, the after schools programs and so on. In many ways, they are the conduit to the uh, uh, they are the conduit to the uh, uh, to the po uh, to the population, but I think we have uh, just at the last point here is we have to dis to distinguish in this thinking about civil society service delivery organization and service delivery organizations are always dependent. The ones that provide, you know, in the United States they may they may be dependent on. Uh, on the, the, the foundations that may be dependent, sometimes they are also dependent on the government and so on. But essentially an organization that provides health care is always dependent on somebody else. They cannot possibly raise the money for that. The pr what becomes problematic is when we, uh, when we support a dependent organization in the name of polit political participation. And that is a totally different uh, issue and that does not work. Yeah, I think just to, to follow up on that, I mean, the Afghanistan example is interesting. The, AI, the AIHRC is extremely influential in the West. Um, inside Afghanistan, people ignore it, and there are no consequences for that. So when we're looking at actually building up some kind of human rights aware society inside Afghanistan, I mean, they're, they're, they do good work, and the monitoring that they do is effective, but their reports are written first in English and then translated into Dari or Pashto. Um, so, I mean, ju just kind of from a, a basic level, they know that their primary audience are, uh, are, are, are Westerners, primarily Americans. And I think you see a lot of that, too, in the media. Like, Tolo, is, Tolo TV is a biggest example I could think of. It started as a USAID project. But now most of Saad Mosseini's sponsors are Iranian. Most of the newspapers in Kabul are funded, at least in part, by Iran. Um, the, the West is not doing a good job of supporting things like press. I mean, Afghanistan does have a free press, and I'd say that's probably the only functioning part of, of their public society. Um, but it's not happening because of Western-funded NGO civil society groups. It's primarily happening by other people trying to leverage their influence. Um, when, when we look at, at how political organization works, I mean, to this day, under a law sponsored by the United States, political parties are more or less banned in Afghanistan. Uh, part of this is because of a desire to tamp down on the militias, as I said before, the Tanzims, which are the primary organizing uh, uh, groups in the 80s were kind of combination political parties and militias. To avoid those militias, to avoid the return of the dreaded warlords, a lot of those groups are prevented from directly and officially organizing in government. Um, because of that, I mean, in a lot of ways, there, there are barriers to kind of the basic level of political organization that we found. And then also the war gets, <laughs> gets in the way of that too. Um, that's why Hazaras, despite being a minority, were gaining shares in parliament because the war prevented Pashtuns and in some cases Tajiks from showing up to the polls to vote. Um, this isn't really a function, I think, of, of civil society flourishing or of other people being successful. It's just kind of what happens in war because things suck and people can't do what they want to do. Um, all right, that's probably. I, I, I'd like to make uh, three, three quick points uh, in response to, to the comments by the moderator and, and the other speakers. Uh, first, I, I do agree with, uh, with Marina that you know, a lot of our money is going to, to uh, NGOs that are not embedded in the societies and disappear when the money goes away. But it's very important, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, not to confuse NGOs, especially those that are dependent on international funding with civil society. 
uh, which is a much broader thing. And in, in, the, in the country that I have studied most deeply, it's Indonesia. You know, some of these Muslim civil society organizations go back to the days of Dutch rule, long before USAID or anything else. Now, where the role of uh, you, you international assistance comes in, and this, for example, in the excellent work that the Asia Foundation has done, which they don't like to be publicized because it can be controversial, but they have helped, they have funded activities by these deeply embedded Muslim civil society organizations to do really good work, uh, including you know the new interpre uh, 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 interpretation of, of the Quran, where they have gone through it to to uh, identify uh, uh, identified a scripture that supports values of uh, of, uh, of tolerance and, and democracy that these organizations do. So there is a very important role for us, but it, as everyone mentioned, we need to be um, uh, need to be careful as to who we fund. Uh, the sec that takes me to the second point: uh, who should be our um, um, our interlocutors? Uh, and I, I am not impressed by the arguments that certain Islamist groups are not terrorists and they're not going around blowing up people. The issue is not terrorism. The issue is what values are these organizations propounding. And if a group is not is, is not uh, is not violent, but their uh, agenda includes uh, includes uh, uh, limitations and restrictions on the rights of women, religious minorities, we have seen attacks on the cops. Uh, since democratization in Turkey, I think that's not acceptable from the standpoint of groups that would like to be our interlocutors. Uh, the, the, the third point, and boy, I can't, I can't remember what the third point uh, <laughs> is, is um, um, at, um, at, uh, at the moment, so I'll let go at that. <laughs> the lady right here? Yeah. There's a microphone there coming to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nevzar Stacy. I'm the president of Hasna incorporated an NGO in Washington, D.C. I loved what Marina said. I have been working 12 years in southeastern Turkey and Cyprus. And I cannot emphasize that we, the Westerners, I consider myself, since I've lived here too long, a Westerner, have really not been honest with the countries we are trying to help. We have not given them the best examples of a, what a good NGO is. As you see, there are many organizations in this country that lack a lot of the virtues that we'd like to see in these organizations. We don't have many organizations that put out their um, income on the website. So we don't abide by many of the things that we'd like other countries, other NGOs to abide. Second, we don't evaluate projects. The point is, whenever I seek money to continue evaluating projects, it is not sexy. So they rather start a project, finish, and then go away. Nobody is interested. And if this is what we are teaching them, why are we surprised that those organizations don't last? European organizations have been giving money to Turkey. It's absolutely appalling that the salaries that they give to people as project directors are totally out of line with what the community can pay or sustain. So what's happening is that we are teaching, we're not teaching at all, out of desperation, out of our inability to work with these countries. We have chosen to set up these organizations, but we're not willing, really, to teach them what a good civil society organization is, you are right with the values. You are right with the mechanics. It's not raising money. It is understanding what a civil society is and really showing good examples from the United States. We have a long way to go to clean up our act here. Does anybody want to respond? Mm -hmm. Just I think you have universal We all agree. Yeah, <laughs> universal <laughs> the lady at the, uh, in the same row. But if we could keep it where we're running. Sure. We're sure OK, I have a quick so. question on Cynthia Butler. Um, in terms of what makes a civil society, it seems like there's a bit of ambiguity still as to what actually comprises a civil society. Um, and and it, it's of particular concern right now, obviously, because the Palestinians are going in September to the UN to get unilateral acceptance as, as a um, one nation, right, a separate two-state solution. And so people are saying, well, they don't have the predicate civil societies set up that would establish a, um, a legitimate state yet. So my question is, in terms of what, what 
kinds of civil society and what type of, I mean, Facebook is not a civil society. Facebook is like the 21st century graffiti on the wall. I mean, Facebook is not a civil, I'm sorry. I mean, it's like show up at the movie tomorrow. I mean, that's Facebook, okay? So what what is a civil society sufficient to be, uh, or a collection of civil societies sufficient to form um, a country such that one could be acknowledged or accepted as a separate autonomous political entity? Because it seems like you've, you've got to have, you know, various formalized institutions. I, I very much appreciate the person saying that it operates within the law. Well, if you have no rule of law and you have no autonomous independent judiciary, what sorts of civil societies are filling in the gap that allows sort of the, the Palestinians to go say, we're now a country and everyone should recognize us? I'll answer that. Uh, actually, um, I, my own personal view is that the issue of uh, Palestinian statehood is unrelated to the issue of civil society. It's literally you know, uh, contingent on uh, other uh, uh, international factors. But I think you raise a very good question as to what sort of predicate civil society is needed. And I want to say for statehood, because you can have a state that's completely despotic with any civil society that functions up to the point when it collapses. And we have seen lots of that. However, uh, I did say, and I think one of the premises of a presentation that I made is that a robust civil society is a predicate of democracy. And that was a point that I actually uh, was going to, the third point that I did not remember. And what we, uh, and while it is true, as has been pointed out here, that, uh, that civil, so civil society or civil society organizations may have been nowhere to be seen in the demonstrations, you know, against Mubarak, or may not have played a role in a variety of transitions, and in fact, civil society per se, you know, sometimes plays a role, sometimes it does not, depending on the nature of the regime and the circumstances of the transition. However, what we did find is that once the transition begins, those societies that are successful in democratizing are societies that have strong civil societies. And I think that's a very, very strong point supported by the literature. Uh, now, that takes us to the question of the Arab world. You know, what will happen in the, in the, uh, to the democratic mov movements in the Arab world where uh, everyone agrees there are no robust civil societies, at least in comparison to other regions of the world. This is one of the points that Huntington made, and I think it's something that should give us pause, that, you know, we see these strong movements toward democracy in a, you know, in, throughout the, uh, the Arab world, and yet, uh, in very few countries, because of the nature of the regimes that preceded this, uh, this, uh, this development, the civil societies are weak or in some cases non-existent. So what does that portend for the future? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to, sorry, going back to this issue, uh, the issue that you raised. I know of no definition of statehood, of no international law, of no legal requirement for the recognition of the state that involves, that mentions civil society. I mean, this is not, uh, this is just not part of the definition of the state. It has never been a requirement. Now, if you say that the existence of a civil society, the, of an organized civil society, and I think we really need, that what constitutes a strong and a weak civil society, we really need a lot more discussion. We don't have the time for it. But, uh, so if you say that that is desirable, the existence of a strong civil society, yes. If you say that it's a condition for, this is a condition for statehood. This is a rule that's being made ad hoc, frankly, whoever is uh, uh, stating that. The young man right here in the front. Hi, Christian Chong. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Faust. Uh, in Egypt, the military as an institution of civil society uh, was an important driver of governance transitions and later on today, stabilization. Um, in the absence of credible political partners that you had alluded to that, are, that, that, that is obvious right now in Afghanistan, um, do you think a similar path uh, is a viable element of our overall development and stabilization efforts uh, within that country? Within, within Egypt no, 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 no. or Afghanistan? Right. Do, okay. you, do you think development yeah. of the military as an institution, as an independent institution, a check on, on yeah. these you know, non-existence non of 
of credible political partners. Yeah, I mean, I, I would kind of describe Egypt um, under Mubarak as something of a Praetorian state, again, where the military had a lot of the functions of the government. You could also look at pre-Erdogan Turkey in the same way, where the military kind of took over the government. You could look at Pakistan kind of shuffling back and forth between the two. Uh, I think it remains to be seen in Egypt if the military is actually a force for democratization. They were a force for toppling Mubarak. Uh, I haven't seen evidence yet that they're actually a force for forming a, a democracy or some kind of civil society. That's completely up in the air. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, I know the hope inside ISAF is that building an effective security uh, 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 an effective security sector is how they will establish the stability to develop a civil society down the road. And um, uh, uh, especially General Caldwell, who runs uh, an, uh, the National Training Mission, um, he's very explicit that the the uh, uh, idea of educating Afghan soldiers, of teaching them to read, teaching them to, to connect with other kinds of literature and to interact with each other outside of their own communities, is very is specifically designed to create some kind of national civil identity. Uh, I think it's completely up in the air whether or not that's going to be effective. I mean, the Soviets tried to do the exact same thing. Uh, they threw a lot more money at it, and they did it for a lot longer than we've been doing it, and it didn't really work. Um, I mean, Af Afghans do have some kind of Afghan identity. They identify themselves as Afghans. You see in the North ethnic minorities that have countries named after them nearby not trying to join them. I mean, they actually think of themselves as Afghan to an extent. Um, but, I mean, the ability of outsiders, especially a military outsider, to impose some kind of society like that, I think, is extremely limited, and it's kind of a mistake to think that we can be very effective at it. You know, the gentleman in the, sh the glass, did you have one? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you, and then... It, it would seem to me that the question, the, the, the overall question we're asking, uh, dominating the discussion is, where is us in them? And that's a foreign policy question to me. And it, it, it to the and the role of civil society uh, in in this uh, overall question is is actually a very minute uh, component. It is not the bigger uh, 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 problem in in the overall scheme of things when it comes to uh, uh, to uh, understanding relationships with them throughout uh, these changing times. And so I, I agree with you, Marina. I mean, um, uh, y you have to understand. Uh, uh, civil society as, as it pertains to them, as it, uh, and it's not just the tens of thousands of people on the streets. Uh, Egypt has, what, 33,000 NGOs? And most of, these, most of these groups are not funded by the U.S. And as you mentioned, some of them will not accept uh, U.S. funding. Palestinians have a lot of uh, uh, NGOs, a lot of uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Some of them are banned terrorists because, because they, uh, uh, they support Hamas. <coughs> Um, and the same thing with, with other, uh, with other Arab, uh, Arab uh, countries. Uh, there are one of the things that uh, have emerged in the literature is that there is uh, a growth, even under authoritarian regimes. There has been a, a phenomenal growth of uh, NGOs that are operating. And they have uh, been using the, the language of, uh, of human rights. And some of those organizations are human rights organizations. And some of them are funded by uh, by the corrupt governments, and they don't operate very well. But ultimately, they, they all contributed to this uh, uh, cultural, uh, cultural transformation of, of political life in the Arab world uh, that uh, no longer can uh, tolerate uh, authoritarianism and dictatorship. Uh, that's, that's my reading. Um. I want to congratulate you for one of the most honest and really stimulating uh, sessions uh, on this topic. I was not expecting it, and um, I think you're really adding to culture. The question of what do we do, how do we go, if I might uh, make a couple of observations and a suggestion. Um, as someone who was your tax dollars at work as a diplomat for 30 years, uh, it seems to me that the, our country has been very good at bureaucracies, institution building, money. We had a lot of surplus money in the last uh, 50 years. And um, solving, if you will, the Cold War, which basically was an interwestern dilemma.
And what we're left with are the remains of that in a world that is no longer in our image of our making of our kind. And I don't say that is an exclusionary, you know, creating of another. I'm saying it, we do not know, as you all have beautifully pointed out, what we're really dealing with. So I would suggest maybe we first need to spend more time looking at ourselves and getting some perspective on why we have been acting and moving and funding and uh, using process as we have at the same time that we're spending a lot more time with the kinds of experience and honesty that we're hearing um, from this panel. And then maybe that will help us uh, move towards beginning to find more precise, more humble, if you will, but more effective ways of contributing to what everybody is excited about and agrees is an enormously important universal uh, touchstone here of people wanting to get out from under uh, dictatorship. But maybe it's not our word and our view of democracy <laughs> to which they will be making their own transition. And I just think we need to spend a lot more time first looking at ourselves in retrospect and with some strategic perspective on the last 50 years to have a better grasp of how we're going to manage and navigate the next 50. I, I completely agree with that. I would say also, I think we need to spend a lot more time really understanding what's going on in this country, understanding who is driving this trend. I mean, I'm focusing now on the Middle East, obviously, because that's what I do for a living. But what, you know, focusing a lot more, what, what is driving these changes? Who are the groups? Where, do, How do they differ from other groups that have been supported in the past? What I see we are doing is it's the usual problem. You have worked for a bureaucracy. We are under pressure to spend money. We are pressured to do something that we have, uh, you know, that we are contributing to, to do this. The MEPI program, the Middle East Partnership Initiative, is ramping up its grants. And when you are in a hurry, to whom do you go? You go to the people you already know, because it takes too long a time to try to investigate the new possibilities, the new groups, and so on. And it's also there is a tendency to go back. One thing that it's making a lot of Egyptians very angry now is that all the, the international organization or the American organ, the, the so-called democracy promotion NGOs, right? The NDIs, the RRIs, IFAS, the Westminster Foundation, the German Party the Institute, you know, all of them, we, the, uh, all of these groups are coming in telling Egyptians how other uh, transitions have taken place. So that they are sending Chileans to tell them about uh, their transitions. And the reaction of Egyptians is, you know, it's very interesting, but what does it have to do with us? <laughs> I'd like to actually follow up on that for a second, if you can. I mean, when, when, when you're looking at it from kind of a strategic perspective, I mean, I can't think of a single case where the United States has intervened in a conflict for the specific purpose of promoting democracy. It's usually to either topple someone we hate or to prevent atrocities. And then afterwards, we kind of sort of fudge our way through some kind of democracy, civil society thing. So I mean, just kind of from, from a, a broad level of policy perspective, I, I don't think in the government even now, even when like the Obama administration is thinking about what do we do when Gaddafi leaves, not only do I not think they have a plan, but they're not thinking about how to develop a civil society. There, there's an assumption that they just kind of, yeah, I mean oil, but there's this assumption that the government and, and social things will kind of take care of themselves and will deal with it if things go wrong. Um, but there's not, I, I think you were right in pointing that out, that there's not a considered strategic understanding of what it means to we're, promote this concept. We're using our leftovers from the 20th century yeah. to impose on a very different era, a very different environmental context, political, geopolitical. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta be start last, with us. Sorry, this will probably be the last question. The lady, um, Kathy Cosman, uh, U.S. Commission on International Relig Religious Freedom. I wanted to follow up on winning the Cold War. Um, it, maybe we have from a foreign policy perspective, but if you look at civil societies in the post-Soviet space, I think we have a lot, we and they, or mainly they, I should say, in the light of the conversation, with mo most of which I agree with, um, have a long way to go 
in fact one could argue they've gone pretty much full circle and possibly even worse compared to the late soviet period so and and of course one i agree that civil society is much broader than ngos and there are many different types of ngos which also could be further delineated etc if there were more time In the interest of keeping things on track, it's, it's exactly 10.30, and so I think we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you very much. Uh, a great panel to start with.